Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's message. Our hope with this content is that it would help you come to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. If you're grateful for this word, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and also you can partner with what Jesus is doing here at Elevate City through giving. There's a link below for that as well. Here's today's message. I can't wait for you to hear it. Well, if you're new, my name is Joey, and I'm so pumped that you're here. Um, if you are new, I want to catch you up on the story. Uh, Elevate City is a new church that launched about a year and a half ago in the middle of a pandemic. My wife and I, Kayla, and uh, some of our very best friends on the planet um, had this crazy idea of in the midst of COVID, in the midst of chaos, that the Church of Jesus couldn't be placed on pause. And so we launched this campus, and we've just seen God do incredible things over the last year and a half, but we truly believe believe that we haven't scratched the surface yet of what we want to see God do in this place. Amen. Um, this is the church that my wife and I and some of our friends that we've been dreaming about since we were like in high school, which tells you a lot about the super cool high schoolers that we were, you know, just had like every color WWJD bracelet, you know what I'm talking about? Like went on church camp and knew all the songs. Uh, we were real cool. But uh, um, although this has been like our dream church, it hasn't necessarily happened in the dream way. Uh, we've met in hotels and movie theaters. We've met in the morning and at night and back in the morning in different times and in different places. And uh, we just have this great sense that as we turn the corner into this fall, that God is going to fling the gates wide open on Elevate City Church and that we're gonna see unprecedented growth. We're gonna see unprecedented steps for the King. We're gonna see pe more people discipled and more people baptized and more families built up, more people reached than we ever have before. And so we're taking this season to prepare for that. And so we've started this collection of talks called it Jesus People. Let me hear you say Jesus People. And uh, the, the, the idea here is that we wanted to remind everybody of like what the church is and why we started Elevate City in the first place. This is a series all about our culture and our vision and our values, the beliefs and behaviors that we hold dear and practice passionately in this house. And so you're really getting a download of the DNA and who we are and what makes this place special and unique and different and where God is taking us. And uh, so far we've hit a couple of our values. Um, in week one, we looked at this idea that we are a Jesus church, that Jesus is our message. Let me hear you say that. Yeah, we're trying to tell everyone the Jesus story. At this church, we're not trying to introduce people into a religion. We're trying to introduce people to a person whose name is Jesus and the reality that they can have a relationship with him. This is all about Jesus in this house. And then in week two, uh, Pastor Joe brought the heat and he talked about the way that we are a now generation focused church. Let me hear you say now gen. Now. And it's this idea that we believe that um, God always uses young people to shake up the kingdom, amen? that kids and students matter here, that we believe it is the obligation of one generation to hand faith off to the next generation, that we should leave the church better than we found it. So we believe that kids and students matter here. We believe that families matter. We will always invest in families and believe that life change in cities and communities happens at kitchen tables. And uh, we'll do everything that we can to raise up a generation of dangerous Jesus followers. We're a now gen focused church. And then last week we looked at this idea that we bleed boldness. Let me hear you say that. And um, it's this idea that the reality of the resurrection feels a dangerously bold faith. Because our God conquered the grave, we stand on the truth of his claims. We unapologetically stand on the word of God. We preach the Bible with integrity and with passion. We don't cave to culture or to popular opinion, but the fact that our God got up out of the grave makes us bold people who take this message to the ends of the earth. And today we're gonna look at Maybe one of our most provocative culture statements, especially in the day and age that we live in, and more to come on that. But this, this morning is all about this idea that we believe that equipping is greater than entertaining. Equipping is greater than entertaining. Let that sit on your hearts for a second. Equipping is greater than entertaining. Let me show you where we get this idea. Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 11 says it like this, and he being Jesus gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I need you to know today that life is not a playground. Life is a battleground. Life is not a playground. Life is a battleground. There is a real enemy who really hates our guts. I don't know if you've opened your eyes in the day and the moment that we're living in, but there is a dark world out there full of real pain and real confusion and real hurt, and there is a real battle for the souls of people happening right now. And because of that, we cannot, as Jesus people, Think about church as a place that we come to just be entertained. Church is a place that we come to be equipped. Jesus people know that I don't show up to church just looking to be entertained. I show up to church looking to be equipped, to be prepared, to be built into, to be grown up up because there is a real battle out there, a real fight to fight, a real war to win. And so welcome to spiritual boot camp, people. Drop and give me 20. Like, wherever you are, okay? Like, we are here today to equip you. Now, don't, don't mistake my words today. I'm not saying that we're not trying to engage you, okay? All it takes is coming to an Elevate City service one time to see that clearly we are trying to engage you and inspire you and awaken something on the inside of you to get the cobwebs to come off your faith, to have your faith ignited and to see passion rise up. Of course, we're trying to engage you. We're just not trying to amuse you. We're not trying to amuse you. Like, this is so core um, conceptually and philosophically to how we think about church at Elevate City. Um, like, this is not a spectator sport, okay? Like, our worship team up here earlier, um, they're not just doing, like, Christian karaoke. That's not what's happening. It's not just so that you can be impressed by their talents or their gifts. They're using their gifts to inspire you to use your gift, this is supposed to be something that you participate in. Like worship is not just where we're watching the show and oh man, that was really good or oh, I don't really like that song or the music was too loud. No, this is worshiping the living God. And I'm not saying that we're not doing this with excellence. Of course, we're gonna do this with excellence because God is worthy of the very best that we can give him, amen? I don't wanna give him just kind of like mediocre, didn't think about it, didn't prepare worship. I wanna think through this, bring our best, get our best musicians with the best talent and the best heart to magnify the living God. And of course, we're using creative expression. Think about it. You were created in Imago Dei, the image of God. You were created to be like him. God created the stars and the oceans and the galaxies and rainbows and butterflies. I think he's worthy of more than an acoustic guitar. And I think that he's worthy of more than just kind of like meandering in here and we're just gonna kind of do our best and like we're just gonna worship God in this really vanilla like way where it looks like, I don't know, Garth Brooks up here singing. Like, no, no, so much more than that. And I love Garth Brooks, okay? Like, no, shame on him. But we want to worship God with all the creative expression that we can because we believe that he is worthy of it. But that does not mean that our primary goal is to entertain you. It is to equip you. Now, this, what I also want for you to know is that it doesn't mean that this isn't for unbelievers. You should feel totally confident to bring your unsaved, unchurched, unbelieving, skeptical, doubtful friends and to know that we thought about service in a way that speaks to them. Like we thought about making service something that's intriguing to people who don't know Jesus, that creates curiosity with them and that makes them wonder. And like... I, Every week, you can just be sure that I plan one statement that makes your unchurched friends ask themselves, are pastors allowed to say that? <laughs> like, y'all know every week is gonna happen. Like last week, it was, or uh, two weeks ago, it was about uh, a lie that I told of conceiving our daughter in Vegas. Y'all remember that one? And uh, last week, it was about fighting my wife. And so every, 
Every week there's gonna be something that is intentional and that is designed to shatter people's stereotype of what church is supposed to be and to bring them into the conversation. And so we are trying to absolutely engage unbelievers, but we are trying to equip believers. We are trying to prepare you to make you battle ready for the fight of faith because there is a war out there. Here's the big idea for the day. Big idea for the day is this, that Jesus' people have been given a new purpose to push back darkness, to rescue people, and to change the world. And that mission is too critical to just go to church. Jesus' people must get equipped to be the church. I'm gonna read that again. Jesus' people have been given a new purpose to push back darkness, to rescue people, and to change the world. That mission is too critical to just go to church. Jesus' people must get equipped to be the church. Like this Sunday should fundamentally change the way that you see everything that we do in this house. It should change the way that you show up to church on Sunday. It should change the way that you small group. It should change the way you go to equip groups. It should change the way that you interact with what we post on social. It should change the way that you pray. It should, everything should be seen through the lenses of they're trying to equip me. They're trying to get me ready for the war that I'm called to face. If you were to uh, join the military and you were to go to a boot camp, what happens in boot camp is they're trying to get the civilian out of you and get the soldier into you. They're trying to, like, like if you ever go to boot camp, you've seen it maybe on TV or maybe you were in the military. Thank you for that. Um, but if you've ever watched that before, you know that like when they show up, they strip them boys butt naked and uh, they make them take their clothes off, hose them down. And then they've got to get on like new clothes. And then the, what does the drill sergeant do? The drill sergeant tells them where to eat and where to sleep and what to dress. They get outfitted in new clothes and they get new rhythms and they get instructed. Why? Because everything that they're doing is trying to equip these men, equip these women to get ready to fight for the U.S. Army. Because there are people who need to be saved, people who need to be rescued, people who need to be protected. And so they need to get equipped for that mission. And it continues. So long as you're an enlisted soldier, you continue to go to drill and you continue to have a sergeant and you continue to have somebody who is uh, pushing your MOS, your specific job and who's uh, refining you in that and who's holding you accountable. And the same is true in the church. We are trying to get the civilian out of you and the new creation of a Jesus person into you. Trying to get you to see life as a Jesus person. That's why Ephesians chapter four says that Jesus gave all of these different positions. He gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, all of those things, if you grew up like in a charismatic church, you're like, hey, pest, I know what that is. If not, you're like, well, what are we even talking about? What's an apostle? What's an evangelist? All of those titles or roles or giftings, depending upon how you interpret it, interpret it, are, um, are things that uh, leaders in the church would have. And so some are, are apostles, some are evangelists, some are shepherds, and we don't necessarily use those titles today, but those giftings are still relevant. And so like, you know, the 12 apostles um, who uh, Jesus walked around with, but there's an apostolic gifting that somebody can have. And that gifting, like apostles would be like men who uh, start churches or, and, and oversee a lot of churches. Like people who are just naturally entrepreneurial, they're good at starting things. That's like an apostolic gifting and then there's a prophet gifting and a lot of us understand a prophet is like somebody who predicts the future right and uh, a lot of us would love that like hey should I take this job or should I not take that job should I move here or should I not move there but a prophet's much more than just knowing the future is that a component of it? Yes, sometimes God will reveal that but what a prophet does somebody with a prophetic gifting is they speak to the now to the right now to what's happening in culture, to the erosion of truth. They speak to it with clarity and with boldness and with passion and they point the way forward. That's what a prophet does. And then an evangelist, what an evangelist would do is this is somebody who's super anointed to preach the word to unbelievers. Like they're just so good. Every time they talk about Jesus, um, people just flock to Jesus in droves and they do it not in a spirit of condemnation, but in a spirit of conviction. They don't feel condemned and bad. They feel inspired and challenged and like they want more of Jesus. And so that's how evangelists are used. And then there's this shepherd teacher or pastor teacher. It's actually better understood as one word and not two. And um, these people, they teach the Bible and they lead the flock and they do it to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, notice what it doesn't say those giftings are for. 
Notice what it doesn't say those giftings are for. Those giftings are not so that, like Jesus didn't give the leaders in the church to entertain the saints. Jesus didn't give leaders in the church to be involved in every church affair that the saints have. He didn't give leaders in the church to know every saint's name, although I would love to. He didn't give leaders in the church to be a part of every ounce of church drama. He didn't give them for any of that. He gave them to equip them. And he gave them as a gift. Like, did you know I'm a gift to you? (laughs) And I hate to say it, there's no return policy, (laughs) y'all. You're just stuck with me, okay? But God literally says, he goes, I'm gifting these leaders in the church to equip you, to build you, to inspire you, to stretch you, to challenge you. And to make you look more like Jesus, Jesus gifted his church with leaders to equip the saints for the work of ministry. God made you as a masterpiece to be a part of his master plan. God made you and I as a masterpiece to be a part of his master plan. There is a work, there is an assignment. You are the church, you are the minister. Jesus' people are called to ministry. It's not just pastors who are called to ministry or church staff that are called to ministry. Jesus' people are called to ministry. And so we're gonna get an acoustic guitar player out here. We're gonna have an altar call. You're gonna come down. Everybody's gonna go to Bible college right now. Let's go. No, I'm kidding. That's not what's gonna happen. But I want for you to feel that sense of weightiness, that sense of calling this morning. You were made for more than the mundane. You were made to be involved in ministry, equipped for ministry. That is what God has made you for. Now, this word ministry is uh, this word, it's also translated this word service. And the idea is like a server who would like take food to somebody at a table. You and I are called to take the gospel to a world that is hungry for it. It's what it means to serve in ministry or like somebody in the military would serve in the service. You and I are called to serve in the service to Christ, to move the mission forward. And I know what a lot of you think, and you're like, dude, this is intense. Like I was just trying to come and get some coffee this morning. Well, I'm sorry, you're called to ministry. Like, look at the way that the Apostle Paul talks about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. No longer a civilian, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, means you're a Christian, you're saved, you're bought with the blood, you've given him your life, you've pledged him your allegiance, you've received his salvation. If you're a Christian at all, even a little bit of a Christian, it doesn't matter if you've been walking with him for 40 years or you just heard a testimony earlier, you gave your life to him and you've been walking with him for four minutes. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, here it is, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, we beg you, we encourage you and challenge you. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is ministry. You are an ambassador, no longer a civilian just passing through this world. You are a minister of reconciliation, an agent of change, a dealer of hope and service to God. Jesus' people know that they've got to get the civilian out of them and they've got to get the minister in them. And that's the kind of church that we want to be. You know, one of the big problems with modern day Christianity is that what a lot of people did is they signed the papers, they enlisted to be a Jesus person to get out of hell, but they didn't read the fine print that said that when you become a Jesus person, it's now your job to make sure as many people get to heaven as they possibly can. That's the work of a Jesus person. It's not just a get out of hell free card. It's it's time to make heaven crowded calling. 
That is the call of Jesus' people. And we have to get equipped, prepared, built into for that calling. Like my job is to do everything that I can to get you ready for the battle. I am trying every week up here to have passion just start to boil inside of you to give you substance and the truth, to not feed you a bite-sized Jesus McNugget snack. Like we don't do Christian happy meals at Elevate City, okay? We're trying to give you some substance to prepare you for the battle. It's not just a drive through Jesus church service and go on with your way, okay? We're trying to get you ready for the war that's out there, for the battle that you're gonna face. We're trying to prepare you and unleash this calling that's inside of you. We're trying to help you not just live a normal life or a complacent life, but a called life where you build Jesus Church. You join him in what he is doing in the world. My job is to help grow you, strengthen you, challenge you, push you, expand your knowledge, teach you a new way, give you a new posture, give you a solid foundation. Why? Or until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Jesus' people know that their lives are supposed to be progressively looking more like Jesus. So what I'm thinking all of the time, is our church looking more like Jesus? Are we talking more like Jesus, prioritizing the way that Jesus would prioritize? Are we loving like Jesus? Do our relationships look like what Jesus say relationships are supposed to look like? Do we sound like Jesus, smell like Jesus? Are we involved in the things that Jesus was involved in? I'm preaching so that you know Jesus and so that you follow Jesus and so that you see it's your job to lead others to do the same. Jesus people are growing people. Jesus people are maturing people. Jesus people are unified people. Jesus people know that their life is about knowing more of Jesus. Ephesians 4.14, so that, it's my favorite part today, we may no longer Be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Don't miss this. So important in the day and age that we live in. So that we equip you so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Listen. If you want to make YouTube your pastor, I promise you, you will find somebody who will entertain you, okay? If you want to make YouTube your pastor, you will find somebody who will preach exactly to where you are, say exactly what you want to hear, and make you feel really good about yourself. And it will be tasty, it will be delicious, but it may not be satisfying. It may not build you up. You can make YouTube your pastor and YouTube will tell you what you want to hear, but YouTube might not tell you what you need to hear. The day and age that we live in, truth is, um, it seems like a commodity that so many people feel like they've got the market cornered on. And there's all of this back and forth in the Christian faith right now with what is true and what do I believe and who do I trust? Do you know the Bible said that was gonna happen? Look at it in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says this, I charge you, like I want for y'all to know this is what haunts me before I get up on this stage. This is what I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about. Like this is what's burning in my chest every time I walk up those stairs and get on this platform. That um, God says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth. And they will wander off into myths. As for you. Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Like if you found for yourself a pastor who will preach and who will say and who will affirm everything you already think, you need to find yourself another preacher. Preaching is designed to teach and to correct and to train and to equip, to give you what you don't have, to correct broken mindsets and broken worldviews that are out there in the world. You know, as a pastor, like I'm always asking myself, are these people equipped? Like have I equipped these Jesus people to identify like the false gospels that are out there in the world? I'm asking myself that. 
Like as you're scrolling through social media, have I good, done a good a job using the truth of God's word and letting you go, hey, let this be your foundation. Not what's happening in the news. Don't let that be your filter. Don't, don't let your friend from college be your filter. Don't let your neighbor be your filter. But have I done a good job helping you see God's word is the filter so that as you're scrolling through social media and you're watching the news and you're binging Netflix, you're able to interpret all of those truths through the filter of God's word. And so that you're able to identify the false gospels, the prosperity gospels and the poverty gospels and the self-help gospels and the American gospels and the happy gospels and the everyone gets in, love wins in the end gospels. Have I done a good job equipping you to deal with that? I think often, have I, have I done a good job as your pastor of just equipping you for how hard life is? Because life is really hard. And Satan punches viciously. And people are horrible sometimes. And real pain happens. And sometimes... We just treat following Jesus like it's going to be this parade where we walk in the park and everything's up into the right and pain never breaks in. And so then when pain does, we start to question our faith and everything comes unraveled at the seams because we didn't teach you that the Bible says that if you wanna follow Jesus, guess what? You will suffer. Anyone who wants to live a godly life will face persecution, the Bible says. I'm asking myself, have I equipped you to stand strong in the storms of life and the chaos of everything that's going around? You know, one of my favorite um, musical artists is a guy by the name of Ben Rector. Any Ben Rector fans in the house this morning? All right, some of you guys need to get cultured, okay? He's a fantastic artist. I love him. And uh, I, I don't know Ben personally, but if you're watching this, Ben, I would love to. Let's play golf and hang out, and I would love front row tickets to your show, okay? So... Y'all share this so Ben sees this, all right? And uh, I don't know if this is true about Ben, but as you read his music and you follow him on Instagram, it seems like Ben grew up in church. It seems like he probably loves the Lord and loves Jesus. And, um, but it seems like life just over the last couple of years has really punched Ben in the face. And um, a lot of the things that maybe it seemed like he knew he believed, he's starting to like question and uh, try to figure it out. Like there's this line, like his latest record is just so good. It's like rocking me. And uh, this won't rock you probably because I'm not gonna read you the entire song, but there's this little section of this song and it's, it, the song's called Heroes. You can go listen to it later. Um, but he says this and he says, I miss my Bible study leader. I had all the answers for living in this big bad world. I don't know if he still talks to Jesus, but his wife is remarried now, and I think he sells garage doors. And there was just this essence in those lyrics that washed over me of Ben growing up in a church that maybe gave him this idyllic form of faith, but that didn't equip him for when life let him down. And I wonder, have I done a good job of equipping you for the fact that Christian leaders are going to fail you? that I'm going to fail you, that your friends are going to fail you, that your spouse might fail you, but that Jesus never will? Have I done a good job? Like I'm asking myself this all the time as your pastor, like have I done a good job of equipping you to be betrayed by Christian friends? Have I done a good job of equipping you to deal with like real loss and real pain? Because mark my words, you will suffer. Have I equipped you for the day that you're going to lose a child for when you're going to miscarry and not be able to make sense of that? Have I done a good job of equipping you for um, having a kid with a special need or with a terminal illness? Have I, have I done a good job of equipping you to journey through this light and not allow your faith to come unraveled at the seams? Have I done a good job of equipping you to be persecuted, to live in the minority, to live in exile, to not have your worldview be mainstream? to be pushed against, to be challenged? Have I done a good job of letting you know that you may go through this life and that people might not like your message or agree with your message, but that it doesn't mean you can't declare that message? Have I done a good job of equipping you for the battle, of equipping you to answer complex questions about police officers and justice and war in the Ukraine and CRT and abortion and the truth of the gospel in the midst of all of that? Like I want to be the kind of pastor who equips you to answer the tough questions that your kids are gonna ask and to answer the tough questions that your gay friends are going to ask and that equips you to answer the tough questions that your transitioning friends are going to ask. 
or in your atheist friends are going to ask and your doubting friends are going to ask. And I want for you to be able to do that and speak to it with grace and truth. It's not just be a silent, scared voice in the midst of culture. Are you equipped? Because that's the kind of people that we wanna be in this house. Have you been equipped to doubt your doubts? When all of the things that begin to push against your faith and make you wonder if you should keep on following Jesus, are you equipped to push back and fight back in the midst of that? We want to equip you to stand firm, to grow up, and to make a difference. This, is, this, this should change how Jesus' people show up to church. Amen? Like you're not coming to church the same next week. Like you're not coming to church the same next week. You're not coming hoping, I just really hope that they sing my favorite song. And I really hope that Joey won't preach so long. <laughs> no, that's not how you're coming. To, you're coming to church going, I am ready. I've got my pen and hand. I've got my journal. I'm ready to take notes. I'm going to think on this stuff throughout the week. I'm going to pray different, engage different. I'm trying to get something that can feed my soul out of this. I'm trying to help this change how I think this week. I'm trying to use this as a weapon of grace to fight back in the midst of the war. It should change how you show up to church, people. It should change the priority of church, that's for sure. All of a sudden, rain ain't so scary, amen? Like, I'm not gonna let the rain keep me from showing up to church. All of a sudden, gathering together with the people of God is a priority that should trump a whole lot of other things out there. Like, we should build this in as something that is fixed in our schedule because we need it. It's not something to entertain us. It's something to fuel us and stretch us and grow us and mature us. And when you show up to church that way, your whole life starts to look different. I want for this to change the way you show up everywhere. You should show up to small group different. I'm looking to get equipped. You should show up to, if you're in an equipped group, I'm looking to get equipped. When you're looking on social, the things that are, I'm looking to get equipped. How is this equipping me, preparing me to do the work of ministry, to push back darkness, to make disciples, to proclaim the gospel, to be Jesus to the people that I see. It should change how we show up to church. Ephesians chapter four, verse 15 says this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Don't miss this. When each part does its part. When each part does its part. Are you doing your part today? Are you doing your part today? I wanna to ask this question, ask it to yourself. It's cute and it rhymes. If everyone churched like me, what kind of church would this church be? If everyone churched like me, what kind of church would this church be? If everyone gave like you, if everyone prayed like you, if everyone served like you, everyone invited like you, if everyone told people about Jesus like you, if everyone led a small group like you, if everyone served in the children's ministry like you, if everyone, if everyone church like you, what kind of church would this church to be? Because the scripture says that it's everyone when the whole body is working together and everyone does its part. Like when this works, right? I want for you guys to know that it's not like Joey out there on the corner with like one of those signs from a car dealership waving it so people come to Elevate City. Okay, that's not what this looks like when this is working properly. And when this is working properly, it looks like all of us pulling together in the same direction to make heaven crowded, amen? All of us saying, I've got a part to play. I've got a calling to walk in. Like the church is really terrible when a whole bunch of people, hundreds of people show up every week and they just watch one guy use their gift. Just one guy up there on stage yelling really loud because that's my gift, right? Just big vocal cords. And church does not work properly when it works like that. It works properly when you realize that my gift is designed to help pull your gift out of you, to push you into what God has called you to do with your life. What is your part to play? Success for me, I want for you to know that success for me is not seeing all of these seats filled. Success for me is when you are as passionate about these seats being filled as I am. 
That is success for me. When you've got a clear sense of calling and a heart for heaven and you're equipped with the tools for living on mission and serving with purpose and giving sacrificially so that heaven gets crowded, so that we shake up this generation, so that we bring revival to this city. That's what success looks like for me. When the people of God realize that what they can do together can change the world. The greatest honor of your life is that you get to serve Jesus. Like this is not a have to today. This is a we get to today. Like what an honor, what a treasure that God would invite his kids to come and play. You remember being on the playground as a kid and there was that group of people that you really wanted to play with but they didn't really wanna play with you? It's happened to my daughter all of the time. She's coming home and I'm asking her how her day was and she was like, well, Eloise, Yesterday she played robots with me, but today she said she didn't want to play robots with me. And I was like, show me Eloise. Which, which one is Eloise? Because I think I'm going to trip her. <laughs> but you remember that like desire as a kid. Like there was that group that you just wanted to be a part of. And it's just like pulling on your heartstrings. There's this God of the universe who's inviting his kids. Come play. Come build the kingdom with me. Come push back darkness with me. You have this potential inside of you that God is trying to pull out of you. You were designed with purpose, on purpose, for a purpose, and that is to push back darkness in this world. And your faith will continue to be boring and stagnant and shallow until you get engaged in the mission. God has so much more for you. But the more that God has for you happens at the end of your comfort. When you get off of the bench and you get in the game, when you realize that Christianity is a participator sport, There is so much more that he has. What an honor, what a dignity that God would want us to come and build his church. I love what Paul David Tripp says about this. I'm gonna close with this today. This quote is so good. He says, each of us have been gifted, called, and positioned to do our part. In God's kingdom work, we all have a part to play. Our histories, personalities, abilities, and maturity levels differ, which is how the redeemer intends it to work. He is sovereign over all. Most of the time we are oblivious to this. We are too easily captivated by our self-centered little worlds. But Ephesians 4 propels us beyond a life consumed by personal happiness and achievement. Your life is so much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It is bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, fashionable clothes. In reality, you are a part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom and progressively shaping them into his likeness. And he wants you to be a part of it. Your life is bigger than you ever imagined. You live in one moment in time, yet you stand hand in hand with Enoch and Noah, with Joseph and Moses, with Abraham and Isaac, with Jeremiah and Ezekiel, with Matthew, Peter, Paul, Augustine, Calvin, Luther, and generations of unknown believers who understood their place in the kingdom and did their part in its work. Only as you keep this huge worldview will you be able to live and serve effectively in the small world where God has placed you. You know, I'm so proud of the people at our church who get this. I could tell you about the Deerings who got involved in an equip group and now they've committed to just lead equip group after equip group after equip group. I could tell you about Lexi who went through an equip group and now runs our community team as a volunteer. I could tell you about Christian who one of the most talented musicians I've ever known, but never played in church till this one, but has gotten equipped and it leads rehearsals and band and music directs. I could could go on and on. I could tell you about Sienna who got equipped, went through equip and uses her social media platform to just tell more and more people about Jesus and brings her friends and baptizes her friends. I could go on and on about Tyler Boss who knew nothing about lighting or setup or teardown or technology, knew none of that, but now runs our entire production as a volunteer because he got equipped to step into his calling here. I could tell you about people who are serving right now in the basement 
who are leading kids to Jesus, teaching them the gospel, seeing it as their calling to build into future generations because they got equipped to live out their purpose. I'm so proud of the people who are getting a vision for their life that is so much bigger than themselves in this house, but I believe it's time for it to happen for you too. There is more darkness that we need to push back. There are more people who need this message. You know, COVID changed so much about church. Changed how people think about church. A lot of people think that COVID devastated the church, that it's causing so many churches to close because people don't come anymore. But what if what God did in COVID was he killed the consumeristic church? He killed the mindset that what I come and do is I fill a seat and somehow you know, do a favor to God by giving him an hour of my time on Sunday morning. What if that died in COVID? What if the mindset of coming to critique the Christian show got thrown out the window and we saw this as a battleground to prepare for the war that we're supposed to fight out there? And what if this became a place where every believer was engaged and saw it as their part to do their part to take the message forward? That's the kind of Jesus people I wanna see. Let's pray. God, thank you that you did not send your son Jesus to die and to conquer the grave and to give us his spirit so that we could sit and critique the Christian show. We are here for so much more than just kind of sharing what we liked and didn't like on the ride home. We're here for so much more than critiquing the volume of the music or the song selection or what the pastor was wearing. We're here to be transformed into tools to build your church. God, I pray that we would never stop being an equipping church, that we would never stop being a building church. We would never stop being a growing church. We would never stop being a giving church. be a church that sees ourselves as a part of the body of Christ who are called to take this message to the ends of the earth. Maybe this is brand new to you today. Maybe you've never known Jesus and you're hearing something in your soul and you're feeling something in your heart just beating out of your chest like, wow, if there's a community that is living to change the world, then I wanna be a part of it. If God can give me a new story and if he wants me to be a part of his family, then I want all in. And if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just wanna give you an opportunity to meet Jesus today. The truth of the gospel is this, is that there's a God in heaven who is crazy about you he loves you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything you've ever done. But there's this reality and we all know it. We've sinned, we've rebelled against God. We've chosen our way over his and that's created separation. But in love, God sent his son to get you back home to his heart. And there's this response, it's you surrender your life. You trust what Jesus did on the cross for your salvation. You believe that because he got up out of the grave that he's who you should follow with your life. And so if you wanna place your trust in Jesus today, I would love to give you an opportunity to do it. If you're wondering at all, if this is the next step for you, if you're like, maybe, maybe that's me. I want you to know that's the Holy Spirit, it's you. And so I just invite you to pray this prayer. Say, God, I need you. I know I've sinned against you, but today I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. And I wanna spend my life living for you. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again from the dead. I put my faith in you today. If you pray that prayer, we just wanna mark it in celebration with all of heaven. On the count of three, I'm just gonna ask you, if you prayed that prayer, to just boldly raise your hand and say, I'm in, I'm a saint, I've given my life to Jesus and I wanna get equipped for ministry. One, two, three, amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate people giving their life to Jesus today saying yes to him, the only way, the only truth, the only life. Jesus, this is your church. We are your people. We ask that you would build this house. Do it for the glory of your name. And all of God's people said, amen.